Okay, good morning. Welcome. Mm. Thank you for coming. Please receive uh, to Engineer Terry Carras and Doug Harman. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So uh, we're here to talk a little bit about two overlapping Python communities, the OpenStack community and the broader uh, Python community. Um, my name is Doug Hellman. Yeah. It's not working? No. Cool. It's not working either. Interesting. Um, and I, I came to uh, OpenStack from the Python community. So I've been doing Python programming since the mid-90s at some point. Uh, I'm working now for Red Hat, uh, specifically on OpenStack. I'm on the OpenStack Technical Committee, which is a, the governing body for, for the contributors. And I'm a fellow for the Python Software Foundation as well. And oh, it's working. Oh, okay, so I... It's working. And, and my name is Thierry Carrez. I work for the OpenStack Foundation. I'm uh, the chair of the OpenStack Technical Committee. Uh, I'm also a Python Software Foundation Fellow, and uh, you can find me on Twitter and Freenode. And so this, I come from the from a OpenStack perspective, going to a Python community, and Doug is taking the other way around, coming from the Python community and reaching out to, to OpenStack. And um, I want to start with a short intro on what OpenStack is. Who knows what OpenStack is? Ah, lucky. <laughs> I don't know what OpenStack is. <laughs> so for the few of you that don't know what OpenStack is, it's um, an yeah, open source infrastructure software that you can deploy on top of basically a data center to make it programmable infrastructure. So it's usually deployed by uh, decent sized companies that happen to own a data center uh, and want to uh, provide resources for their internal development efforts or uh, other types of companies that want to run a public cloud, basically, and offer resources for rent to, um, to the wider public. It's not exactly something you would deploy in your garage uh, on a Sunday. And, and I think that's where the corporate image comes from, because the users are a large, large organizations and not really small uh, things that you would deploy as an individual. And this translated into... Um, uh, um, uh, 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 a negative corporate image for the project itself, which is a bit unfair because as we'll see, uh, it's actually one of the most community-led projects out there. Um, in particular, we have a fairly independent technical governance. Um, we elect our project technical leads. We also elect our oversight board, the technical committee is the technical oversight board for the OpenStack project. And the election is based on one contributor equal one vote. It's not one contribution, it's not one company, it's not, it's really if you contribute to OpenStack, you get one vote to elect the leadership uh, of the project that will decide where, where the project goes and if something gets done or not done. Um, we also have a set of principles, which we call the four opens. The first one is pretty obvious, open source. Everyone does it those days. Um, but the others are slightly less obvious. A lot of people do open source. Uh, a lot of people do also open development. Uh, by open development, we mean that everything that's happening in OpenStack development is done uh, publicly in the open on publicly accessible websites. You don't have to be, uh, uh, you don't have to sign up. You don't have to be an existing contributor to see how the development is done. We do all our code reviews, all our specs, uh, all, um, all our RC channels, all our mailing lists are fully public and open. And we also run only open source tools in our project infrastructure. We don't rely on GitHub. Uh, we, um, we have even the configuration for this project infrastructure is also uh, uh, open source and committed in, in our repositories, in our Git repositories. So everything is transparent. We also do open design. Uh, the design of OpenStack is not done by a small group in a, in a corner and then the, the rest of the community is there to just do extra work. Uh, everything from, from uh, base design, new project is done 
uh, within within the within the community. We, there is no secret group that does things uh, in in the, in the corner. And finally, we also do open community. Um, by that, we mean that anyone can uh, raise to leadership positions in OpenStack. You don't, uh, especially, you don't have to be a sponsor of the OpenStack Foundation or, or coming from a large company that happened to be there at the beginning to be uh, 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 an important member of our community. So you can get elected to project technical leadership positions. You can also participate to the project as equals without any, uh, uh, any attention paid to who actually pays for your, uh, for your work or who, where you're coming from. And um, we don't have, we're, we're pretty adamant that we need to have a level playing field. It means that anyone coming in the project should have equal chances to uh, contribute to the project. So we reject projects that would uh, uh, benefit one company or uh, uh, be where contributors from coming from one organization would have a, a specific advantage. For example, if you work on um, if a vendor wants to propose a project in OpenStack that is, requires a specific hardware, like Cisco switch that costs tens of thousands of dollars, uh, then that project could not be an OpenStack project because basically people that have access to that hardware have, uh, have an, an advantage against someone that comes from nowhere. We don't have appointed positions. We don't have dictator for life. We believe that change in leadership are good, and uh, that's where... Uh, that open community thing comes from. And finally, uh, to close this introduction, I wanted to raise a bit about the Big Ten thing. Um, we used to define OpenStack technically, and, and so when a new sub-project would be proposed, we would try to assess if that fits our mental picture of what we think OpenStack is. And uh, that was pretty useless exercise. We ended up having those discussions. This, does this project is it OpenStack? Is it something that uses OpenStack? Is it something? And that was not really useful. And uh, that's, at that point, we realized that what binds us all together is those principles, the way we do development, the fact that we are a single community, more than a very uh, defined scope on what exactly OpenStack is and where it stops. And so we moved from from defining if a project is OpenStack to judging the community that was producing it. Are they following our principles? Are they coming from, uh, are, they, are they part of the OpenStack community? And if they are part of the OpenStack community, then they are an OpenStack project. There is no reason why we should say this is OpenStack, this is not OpenStack. So we moved from a very um, product-oriented definition of what an OpenStack project is to a very community-centric definition of what an OpenStack project is and that has served us uh, quite well uh, until now. So, uh, the middle of the matter. What Python brings to OpenStack first? So I was there at the beginning when we picked languages, and um, I think the reason six years ago where we picked Python originally for OpenStack, uh, the major reason was that it was pretty important for us at the beginning that we would get packaged into distributions uh, I had past experience. I worked for Canonical before, and we packaged Java software uh, uh, for for our cloud offering back then. And Java is really poorly supported in distros, uh, while Python was extremely well supported, still extremely well supported. It was the major language for development within Canonical at the time. And so uh, picking Python gave us a step up with distribution integration. We didn't have to fight against the distros so that they would support us. Uh, it's also extremely easy to read, which means there are not so many ways you can write stuff. And so um, uh, there is no uh, endless bike shedding on exactly the format of your patches, etc., etc. Uh, it's easy to learn. My 10-year-old daughter is learning Python right now, and she's quite successful at it. So. It's really easy. Uh, it's easy to patch because you, whenever you run Python code, you have the source code. It's not as if when you run a Java stack, you end up with jars and you, you have to download or look at the source code separately, but anyone uh, running OpenStack can actually look at the code that is running, see potentially a, a mistake, a bug somewhere, and propose a patch. It's really easy. And finally, the last thing was Ops Familiarity. The target user, direct users for OpenStack are the operators that would deploy it. 
And so picking a language that was um, um, something that they were familiar with was really helping us as well. So they are, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, their operators are using Python internally already, and so uh, that also gave us a step up with reaching out to our users and closing the feedback loop was a lot easier thanks to that. So Thierry mentioned that we chose Python six years ago. Um, we've had discussions recently about changing, but we have found a lot of reasons why uh, Python is still successful for us. Um, as an integration language, it's uh, very common to, especially in our project, to uh, need to interface with lots of different devices or other services. Uh, most of the OpenStack services are actually built on top of other tools that have already existed or are written in other languages, and Python makes it really easy to communicate with all of those things. Uh, part of the reason for that is the large ecosystem of libraries that's available for Python uh, from the package index, and uh, that just continues to grow every day, so uh, we, we find that a, a, we don't have to write all of the source ourselves in order to, to build things. Um, it continues to be easy to read, so six years in, we have a lot of old code, and it's uh, very important for new contributors to be able to go and look at that old code and understand what it, it's about, and uh, Python's uh, readability makes that easier. Um, six years in, we continue to have a lot of new contributors joining our project, and so having a language that is still easy to learn is a, a, continues to be an important reason to use it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a bit. Um, and then the community itself, uh, the inclusiveness um, gives us good examples for subgroups. So PyLadies is a great example. We have uh, Ladies of OpenStack uh, group that's uh, organized in a similar way. Um, we have uh, uh, folks that go to conferences and join meetups and that sort of thing, which are all very welcoming to uh, brand new members. Uh, the, the, the example that the Python community sets for welcoming new members is really important to us. So we've talked a little bit about why we think Python is great for OpenStack, and I wanted to talk also a little bit about why uh, OpenStack, I think, is a good thing for the Python community. Um, there are three main areas for that, um, funding, contributors, and quality. Um, a lot of us don't like talking about money. Uh, as we saw this morning in the keynote, though, it is important. You know, we're all trying to make a living doing this, and uh, OpenStack gives us a good opportunity to be paid to do open source work. Um, often the companies funding that work have goals in mind, but there is still quite a bit of freedom in what you can do, and the way the community itself is organized um, lets you uh, take advantage of the fact that there's a, a demand for that. Uh, so OpenStack companies, when they're looking for um, new employees, they're, they're typically looking for one of three different uh, key areas, either some previous experience doing cloud or infrastructure automation of some sort with uh, DevOps tools or um, existing cloud systems. Um, they also look for techn specific technologies, like maybe you're a storage expert or you have really expertise in networking uh, or virtualization, uh, or they look for Python expertise because Python is a key component of OpenStack. So this is some uh, job information. This is trends for job listings containing keywords, uh, Python, OpenStack, the combination of the two, storage, networking, and virtualization. And this is US data because that's what I had available, but OpenStack is an international project and I would expect the trends to work in a similar way. And this is showing growth in those job listings over time. Um, Things like storage, networking, and virtualization, um, and actually uh, Python by itself are all of those lines along the bottom that are relatively flat. Some of them even go down a little bit over time. Uh, but if you look for uh, OpenStack jobs, that's the orange line in the middle that, that is trending up. And if you look for OpenStack and Python together, that's the green line at the top. So uh, there's definitely an increased demand, and that's, um, 2,100% growth over that time. So um, That growth in demand uh, has the expected impact on salaries. 
Uh, OpenStack salaries are 17% higher than standard Python salaries. Uh, but even Python salaries, just standard Python jobs, uh, the salaries are, are trending up as well. Um, that, I, I believe, has a lot to do with the demand uh, that's from the increased use of Python within the OpenStack community. Other than a salary, uh, there are a lot of other benefits to being an OpenStack contributor. Um, you are valued as a member of the community for your contributions that you give in your name, not just by the employer that's providing you know, uh, funding for you. Um, your influence is based on your reputation, and so uh, that means that you have job mobility. So we have a lot of members of the community uh, have moved jobs with, while staying within the same place in the community, but they're working for a different employer. Um, I, I myself am on my third OpenStack job right now. So. Um, it lets you find a company where you feel like it's a good fit, a good size, and a good role for you. Um, if you are interested in product-based companies, there are lots of those. If you're interested in service-based companies, there are lots of those. Large enterprises, startups, you, know, you name it, there's a, an opportunity there. Um, and it lets you uh, find a fit for you both within the community and within an employer. That uh, influx of Python developers, folks who are joining OpenStack uh, to work on OpenStack, uh, means that they're also learning Python, they're also joining the Python community. So uh, we have, uh, Thierry mentioned Java earlier, we have a lot of folks who are joining our community coming from more enterprise uh, situations where they are used to programming in Java. They're learning Python, which means there's a lot of opportunities to sell training to those people. Um, they are also, many of them, for the first time, learning about open source. Uh, if they're used to working on closed source applications, then they don't know about open source communities, so they're learning about that and getting excited about their jobs again. And uh, joining the Python community, coming to conferences like this one, um, going to meetups in their local uh, or regional area, um, joining the Python Software Foundation, um, and then contributing in other ways, so outside of OpenStack, contributing to other Python-based projects. So um, another way OpenStack contributes to Python is quality, and by quality I don't mean the quality of OpenStack software, I mean quality insurance that you can get for Python libraries out of OpenStack using them. Um, so this is a number, and I don't expect you to guess what that means it's actually the number of test jobs that OpenStack runs on a given typical workday. Uh, that means we run a test every four or five seconds. And th those tests actually take around one hour to run. And, and they deploy OpenStack software, they run functional tests, etc., etc. So what that means, uh, we are using new Python libraries as they go out. We automatically integrate them. Uh, by the time they reach our PyPy mirror, then we'll start using them. That means if a Python library new release breaks everyone, it will break us really, really fast. And so there are lots of times where we detect problems before anyone else. The other interest in having that kind of, um, uh, of, of number of tests is that we also catch corner cases and race conditions. If something is working 99.99% 99 .99 of the time, we will hit it, like several times a day. And, and so it will break us too. And we, so we can contribute bug reports, on, especially on new releases that break us really, really fast. And that's not just talking about it. I have a few, few examples here. Uh, PyMemCache 130, if you're in the room, it's OK. Uh, that, that was released on a Friday, July 24. Uh, last year, it moved exceptions around in a backward inc incompatible way, so if you were catching exceptions, then you get screwed. The bug was spotted on Sunday, and, and then we reported that, and the new release was released on the same day. That's a classic release regression, and we caught it really fast. Uh, Kizu.2.1 had a deadlock when acquiring a log that was already acquired, which is kind of a corner case but should have been in their functional test suite. Uh, the bug was reported uh, the next day, the day after the release, and they fixed it just the day after. 
And finally, net at DDR 0716 failed on, pre on validating a previously valid MAC address corner case again. Uh, and we, we reported it the next day and we got it fixed. So the amount of testing we're running within OpenStack helps uh, uh, getting regressions detected really fast on Python libraries because we're using a lot of them. Right, so Thierry gave a couple of different examples of, of dependencies that we have. We actually have over 300 dependencies in our global requirements list for the different sub-projects of OpenStack that, um, to use. Um, and so part of uh, what we want to do, not just reporting bugs, but we also want to contribute code to those code bases as well, uh, either directly or indirectly. Um, we directly create libraries um, that we hope that other people will find reusable as well. So these are just a few examples of recent releases that we've had, uh, different libraries with different, you know, from com command line frameworks to testing libraries to packaging tools. If you, if you saw the previous talk the, about Haskell where he was talking a lot about making uh, packaging more declarative, the PBR library is something you might want to check out. That's a, a good wrapper on top of setup tools from doing you know, declarative packaging. Um, so in addition to our own libraries, uh, we've built some tools that you don't necessarily need to be a Python programmer to find value in. So uh, Jenkins Job Builder is probably the most popular one of these. It lets you use YAML files and templating syntax to uh, deploy copies of jobs with slightly different um, uh, parameters, um, and it automatically updates Jenkins. So it's very common to see that. Uh, set up with a commit hook so that when you check in a new uh, YAML file, your Jenkins uh, server automatically updates itself, um, which makes uh, managing your test systems really easy. And there's a bunch of other testing-related tools and release notes tools and things like that that are uh, usable no matter what programming language you're writing your code in. And then we do um, contribute upstream as much as possible. So I, I did a just in preparation for this talk, I did a really quick survey of our community, um, and I had a, uh, 20 or 30 different packages that were uh, suggested as things that people uh, contribute to. Um, mostly there was evidence for each of these. It ranged from uh, bug reports to bug fixes to new features to documentation, um, all, all sorts of things like that. And the, the range of all of those tools is pretty broad given the number of dependencies that we have. Uh, on occasion, we've even taken over libraries where the uh, original maintainer said that they were no longer interested or able to support it, um, but we still needed it as a dependency until we could uh, migrate onto either a newer tool or uh, replace it entirely in some other way. Um, and so these are a couple of examples that I, I was able to find where we'd done that. Um, each of these tools is... Uh, a, a key component in one part of OpenStack somewhere, or most of them are actually used in multiple components. Um, and so it was important to us that they continue to receive bug fixes, and in a couple of cases, uh, security fixes were important. All right, so we've talked about uh, things that we're already doing to work together. Uh, we also wanted to highlight a few things that we should do to improve the symbiosis between the two projects. And Thierry's going to start by talking a little bit about things the Python community can do. All right, so one of the things you can adopt from OpenStack is to do actually some testing before you commit. Uh, in OpenStack, uh, we can't really commit anything that doesn't pass the test. That's a good pattern. Uh, a lot of people do it. Uh, but th some others don't uh, because they have commit rights, they can just push things and yeah, you, you will test around release time but then you don't get around to do it. So having some kind of an automated framework where you can only commit things that pass tests and then whenever you, you have a regression, you just add the missing test so that you don't get caught by the same issue next time. I think it's a great, really great pattern. Uh, there are lots of regressions in libraries. We produce libraries. We also regress quite often, and, but that help, really helps uh, getting them under control. And the next tip is to, if you're a library author, you should really use semantic versioning. Um, so the idea is to signal the type of change that's, hap that's been happening since the last release. Uh, if you uh, only 
fixed bugs, you just increase the patch level. If you change a behavior or add a new feature but did not uh, break backward compatibility, you just increase minor. And if you break backward compatibility and that happens, uh, then you increase major. It is simple, but uh, a lot of people don't follow that. And it really helps uh, the users of your libraries assess the risk that they are exposing themselves to by upgrading and the amount of care that they need to apply before they, they, they use your release. So uh, sometimes it's counterintuitive because you will increase the major version number for a security bug fix because the only way to fix the security issue is to break backward compatibility. So you end up with a big bam bump. But from a downstream user perspective of your libraries, it's really helpful to know that if you upgrade to that version of the library, something might get broken versus there is no chance something gets broken because it's only a patch, uh, patch bump. Next one, um, once it's out, it's out. If you put a broken release out, uh, the solution is not to delete it from PyPy and pretend it never existed. It may look like the easy solution and uh, to a very embarrassing situation. It's, it, I mean, it happens to everyone and we, we do quite a lot of them yeah, as well. Monthly. <laughs> but uh, you really can't recall the message. Once it's out, it's out. The cat is out of the, of the bag. Uh, someone on the internet will have downloaded it. Some PyPy mirror or cache will have a copy of it. And so if you remove it and pretend it never existed, then you've made an embarrassing situation, embarrassing and confusing. And so that's not really, rewriting history is not giving you anything. You should just roll forward, release a new version that fix it, and in your uh, project documentation history, just tag that version as unusable, and that's fine. Uh, it's the only way to, to really make progress in a constructive way. Uh, last piece of advice, don't release on a Friday. Um, and by Friday, I don't really mean Friday. Like, like, just don't release before you go into an extended vacation or, you know, last hour of the day and go to sleep. Uh, because for the previous, due to the previous points, you will release regressions, uh, that happens to everyone, and so you kind of need to be around to fix it and get early feedback from people that can report that it's broken. So wait until Monday, just or, or do it what in the middle of the week when you still have a few days uh, ahead of you, rather than uh, do it as the last thing before you disappear. But there's also plenty of things OpenStack can do to make Python better. Right, so the first of those is um, contribute even more upstream than we do now, um, it, both in terms of uh, uh, creating new things that are more usable than what we have, but also uh, contributing to all of those 300 plus uh, dependencies that we have. Um, in not just fixing bugs, but also writing new features. So we frequently write little wrappers around uh, libraries to do extra things that we feel like we need to do uh, a lot of this could really be contributed to the library itself to make either uh, wrapper APIs that are part of the native library or uh, just extend the existing API in some way to make the library more featureful and, and give those things to everyone. Um, we've become a little bit better uh, about creating reusable components uh, from OpenStack. Uh, a lot of them are really only reusable within other OpenStack projects because of the nature of some of their dependencies. They, they sort of expect to be running inside of a, an OpenStack framework in some way. Um, but I had a list of six or, or so uh, libraries that we've created recently. Um, and there are, there are actually a few others that we have that aren't well documented yet that, that uh, I could have mentioned on that slide. So we need to do a better job of, of uh, finding places where our code is not so special and snowflakey that we can't uh, give it to other people. Um, and then highlight the work that we've already done. So I mentioned that we have some things that are not well documented. Uh, we should fix that, uh, work on the documentation. Um, we do have a bunch of documentation for our libraries up on uh, docs.openstack.org slash developer. So if you uh, are interested in taking a look at what we have, all of the documentation is hosted there with, uh, with our other documentation. Um, and then we should also be doing some work to uh, share the tools and experience that we have by coming to conferences and speaking more often. So 
Uh, frequently, uh, it's, it, it's, it's pretty common to have folks come and talk about OpenStack itself, but there are a lot of aspects of the work that we are doing that is not specific to OpenStack um, and experiences working on large open source projects at scale, um, deploying things at scale, automation, things like that, that uh, we could talk about using OpenStack as an example, but not requiring that you care about OpenStack in particular to make use of that stuff. So if you are interested in learning a little bit more about OpenStack, there are a couple of other members of the community who are presenting this week. Um, and uh, Terry, you had something else you wanted to add at this point. Um, yeah, we actually have the OpenStack Summit every six months, and it's going global every, everywhere. It comes to Europe every two years. And this year in October, it's in Barcelona in Spain. So uh, if you're local, want to join, it's a great experience to be around and and, and it's actually free to attend if you contribute one patch to OpenStack, so you might be interested in get, doing that. Uh, and if you have any trouble, like travel assistance or, or anything, we also have a travel support program to send people that don't necessarily are paid to work on OpenStack and are interested in learning more uh, so that they could attend the events. So if you're interested, you can also join us in Barcelona because it won't get in Spain until at least two or four years from now. So take the opportunity if you can. And that, that concludes the talk, I guess. Thank you for uh, joining us. We have plenty of time for questions. Thank you to the organizers for providing those awesome orange mm -hmm. towels that match our slide theme. <laughs> uh, a question? OK. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, when do you think OpenStack is going to move over to Python 3? That's a great question. Um, we have been working on that for a couple of years. Actually, I've been involved in OpenStack about four years now, and we've been working on it at least that long. Um, the, the process is, has been a little slow, so the first phase... Um, well, first of all, I should explain that it is, given the size of the contributor base and the number, the amount of code, we try not to do things big bang. So we try not to say, we're going to move everything to Python 3 right now. Um, so we phased it into a couple of different uh, steps. So the first phase was to make sure that we were only using dependencies upstream that supported Python 3. And uh, I think Eventlet was one that it took a little while to get a Python 3 version that was stable for us. Um, there were a couple of others, but that was sort of the big one where we knew we really didn't even need to bother with anything else until that was ready. Um, and then the next phase was to make sure all of our internal code, uh, our internal libraries that we manage were, were ported, and that step is done. Uh, we have most of the projects running unit tests under Python 3 now, so they run under Python 2 and Python 3. And we're at the step where we can start running our functional tests. And so projects are starting to set up their deployments for the continuous integration tests uh, to run under Python 3. So one, one thing we do is uh, that once uh, you get the unit test to pass with, your, with Python 3, we, we run tests for Python 2 and Python 3 so that you can't really reintroduce a regression on that. And so we, we support both. At some point, we'll probably only support Python 3 and go forward, but the, the idea is to support both uh, first, and like Doug said, we, we already have libraries, and I think like 80% of the, is Victor here? I think we're down to Nova and Swift. Yeah. And, and that's okay. the, the, the work is coordinated by one person, Victor. Okay, Stinner. so. Okay, thank you. Another question for you. Hi, Terry. Hi, uh, Doug. So there's been a lot of discussion lately in the community about adopting Go because, you know, uh, it's faster for some stuff. How is the community facing this problem in terms of feeding back, you know, the limitations of performance kind of code to the community, uh, in particular with the async uh, kind of uh, code? Yeah, so it's, it's a bit of a complex discussion to have because at, at, on one hand, you want to give developers the tool that they need to do their job. On the others, uh, like, like I said on the slide about the big tent, we basically define OpenStack as being a single community, and so it's really difficult to fragment it around uh, language lines. Even if Go is not the worst 
language we could work from, uh, work with, coming from Python. Uh, it still will create fragmentation between the part of the community that only does Python and the part of the community that only does Go and the people that do both. And so it's a, it's a bit of a struggle to try to uh, uh, like enable developers to do it without ruining our, our community. Uh, the way we've been looking into that is every time uh, uh, someone has a need for Go in OpenStack, it's usually that they have some kind of a specific problem that we kind of need to look into. And uh, for example, on, on, a, on a recent one, uh, people assume that Go will be faster for async programming and, and very, uh, very fast network outputs. And the recent progress on, on uh, AIO, HTTP, and other libraries in Python uh, shows that it's not necessarily true. And sometimes it's education, sometimes people just want to jump to the new shiny thing that everyone else is using. So we need to kind of debunk that. Uh, and if people still have a reasonable uh, use case for Go, we, we need to find a way for them to use Go. Uh, they could also develop a Go library in a corner and call it from Python code. They could, I mean, there are other ways to allow developers to use Go without fragmenting the community and currently we're basically looking into how we can unblock developers without without winning the community. And as far as uh, upstream work, um, uh, Larry Hastings is giving a talk about the gillectomy that he's working on to remove the gill and I think that was one of the big performance issues that one particular project was seeing. Uh, he's giving a talk on that later this week so I'm looking forward to, to that. Um, and we do have a couple of members of our community who are Python core developers, and they're well aware, Victor Stinner especially, is well aware of the async issues. Um, and I expect all of that stuff is being fed back uh, upstream that way. Um, but we're sort of at the, the point where the, we have a particular project where it is very clear that there are, are low-level issues dealing with hardware devices for, for their performance. Um, and, and as Thierry said, there may be architectural changes to that particular application that are needed um, in order to split it up. But uh, everything that we do, we've, we've been trying to, to push back upstream um, as, as far as issues and performance. I've filed a couple of bugs myself. I know some other members of the community have too. Okay, thank you. Last question for here. Along the same line of the last question, uh, you briefly mentioned that you were thinking about replacing uh, Python somewhere in the past. What were the languages you were, th you were thinking about as contestants to uh, yeah, Python? Uh, so uh, we're, we're not thinking about replacing it wholesale. There are a couple of projects that have run into particular performance issues um, at very, very low level dealing with storage devices. And uh, those projects are uh, experimenting with writing things in Go. Um, I'm not sure whether they evaluated any other languages. No, and we also had a number of projects that wanted to uh, have a project written in Java, but it was more because they had loads of corporate developers that were Java developers somewhere, and they wanted to reuse them for OpenStack without training them to a new language. So there was no technical reason, it was more like a, like a business reason. And so that's the two things. At one point there was Erlang, at the very beginning, people wanted to, to write a message queue and they said that Erlang would probably be the best thing for it. Uh, so every now and then someone has a very specific use case that they want to use a very specific language for. And our role as the technical committee for OpenStack is not necessarily to give direction for every project to follow. It's more to make sure that we still have this coherent community and follow those principles that we've set. And so we, the language is, is, is a thorny issue because of this potential for fragmentation versus uh, the need for technical uh, abilities. Like, uh, like Doug said, Go is the, the big thing right now. People want to rewrite things in Go. So um, we need to have them pose and look at the problem really uh, deeply before, before we can actually say, well, Go is the only solution for you. Python can actually be made to work for you probably, and you should look into every specific issue in detail before you switch. And we, we do use plenty of JavaScript for uh, front-end work and uh, bash scripting and things like that. So it's not that Python, everything in OpenStack is written in Python, but most of the application stack is written in Python. Okay, okay thank you, Yunus, for this interesting conference. And thank you very much to you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.
Ah, pues no, de...